Hello and welcome to the Meaningful Tourism Webinar today, December 13th, 2022. I'm very happy that you could make it to have uh, the time to join us. And uh, let me start with a little presentation. So we are celebrating today the publication of the new ebook of the Meaningful Tourism Center which is called Meaningful Tourism, Best Practice Examples for a Sustainable Future. And in the webinar today, uh, we will have a short introduction about what is meaningful tourism. I'm happy to give you in a few minutes and then I will have a quick uh, review of the Meaningful Tourism Award 2022. And the reason for that is that the ebook we are talking about and we are publishing today is made up mainly by the 18 tourism award winners and honorary mentioning which has been uh, rewarded at the meaningful tourism award so that everybody can learn from these best practice examples for the work of the company or organization uh, of those reading the book and uh, maybe also now watching this webinar. So six of the award winners are actually also in our panel and uh, you will meet them one after the other. So we will have Lars von der Wettern from Singular Places and he will introduce their network, which is much more than just a booking platform. We will have Peggy Roden she will uh, tell us about what with locals is doing, how you can have instant friends in more than 100 different cities. We will have Dr. Raj Yoshi from Adventure Boutique. Uh, and uh, they have very interesting programs where they establish long-term relations for, with most of the travelers and the uh, hosts visited through the close encounter and the special encounters they have during their trips. Then we will have Christopher Grime, and uh, he will talk about sustainable luxury being uh, part of the small luxury hotels of the world's organization. And one of the resorts from that organization was also one of the award winners. Then we will have Jani Gutka from Unseen Tours, and she will talk about a city, namely London, seen from a unique perspective. And that is the perspective of formerly homeless people who are now, with the help of Unseen Tours, can work as tour guides. And finally, we have Callum Matthews, who is uh, working with 4VI, which used to be the DMO of uh, Victoria Island in British Columbia and Canada. And they have totally changed their organization structure and their aims. And that will be certainly very interesting for DMOs and NTOs, but also for everybody else involved in the future of tourism. And then I will do a little summary at the end to finish our webinar. So uh, just to let you know who is talking to you, my name is uh, Professor Dr. Wolfgang Georg Alt, and uh, I'm a proud fellow of the Royal Geographical Society and of the Royal Asiatic Society. This is what the FRGS and the FRIS at the end of my name me uh, means. And I've been working for many years with the Chinese tourism market, but uh, along the list you can see here, uh, what is important today is especially that last year I had the po uh, possibility and the opportunity to start the Meaningful Tourism Center. And also I have been uh, publishing not only uh, the first uh, Red Marks uh, publication, what we talk about today, so the uh, best practice examples for a sustainable future publication, but also uh, I have been invited to 
contribute chapters to two uh, edited books, one to the big uh, encyclopedia of trust management and marketing, and one to the Routledge Handbook of Trends and Issues in Global Tourism. And uh, in each of them, I could provide a chapter on meaningful tourism. And uh, yeah, of course, there have been also a couple of articles, maybe the most important one published by Focus Right, uh, why the world needs meaningful tourism. So when we go back to 2019, we can see that at that time already, before the pandemic started, Global tourism has been reaching a tipping point. So we were in danger from moving, being a provider of fun and peace to in the public eye being seen as agents of destruction and pollution of over tourism. And we uh, saw something developing, which was called flick scum, flight shaming. And uh, these pictures illustrate what we are talking about, mass tourism, uh, destruction and uh, the host communities fighting against tourism. If this is the uh, people in Venice uh, against the cruise ships on the Gran Canal or in Barcelona, the people feeling that the tourists have taken away the city from them. So that was uh, a problem for, for tourism, which had... Uh, resulted in a lot of discussions and in the idea that we need to change something. And an additional point, of course, was also that more and more non-Western tourists joined the international tourism. So about a quarter of all the international trips in 2019 were made by Asian tourists, for instance, and they felt uh, not really fully accepted and respected. And also at the same time for many people who have been traveling a lot that they were saying and complaining that they felt more and more bored by uh, offers which seem to be the same all over the world uh, from Starbucks uh, uh, or to beach resorts all looking exactly the same. So we we're seeing a development where quantity was more and more killing quality. So where we had a very uh, big success economically, so the number of international trips uh, increased five times in 40 years between 1980 and 2019. But the destructive side of tourism was became becoming more and more apparent. So what we can see is so that the development of tourism from the demand side is something which also happened before the pandemic already, that we have we can see a clear development from recreation to experience. So the reason why people are traveling uh, is not only holiday, Exact, uh, exactly, there's a lot of other reasons and often mixed purposes during one trip. So we have, for instance, digital nomads uh, going to places to work there uh, with their laptop, wherever there is a nice place. Uh, we have still VFR business, uh, VFR trips where people go and visit their friends and relatives and uh, with more and more people having friends and relatives in other countries, also international travel is growing by that. And if your grandmother lives uh, in Spain you and has her 70th birthday, you will travel to Spain. Never mind uh, how, because, and, you, and it will not be that you like Spain especially, but this is where grandmother lives, so you have to go there. We still see that uh, business and mass tourism is still existing. So we all learned during the pandemics that for some standard meeting, uh, you can use uh, Zoom or other technical uh, online platforms. Uh, but if you want to be creative, if you want to meet new people, if you want to form teams and uh, projects, you still have to meet 
face to face in a real physical place. We see increasingly people traveling for religious reasons. We see with the average age of tra travelers getting uh, towards older semesters, an increased interest in culture and health. For younger people, uh, education, going to travel and study abroad is getting more and more important. And we see a big increase in special interest trips. So people going to different places for bird watching, playing golf, food, whatever. So, and many more. So we can see that the, uh, we can say we have a whole universe of unforced mobility motivations in, in the world because the need for, for bodily relaxation is not the main point anymore. Those people who can afford to travel internationally are pro more likely to sit in front of a computer than working in a field or in a coal mine or a factory. So that was already before COVID-19, but with the pandemic and with everybody being uh, in partial lockdown or in uh, uh, restricted situations and with much less traveling possible for a long time, it became apparent for many people that life is fragile and that the stability of personal circumstances can be shattered uh, faster than, than you think. And so that this shallow consumerism forms of, of tourism, which has been have been called uh, 3B, beach, beer, and boredom, or 3S, sea, sun, and sex, which in the Chinese variation used to be sightseeing, shopping, and selfies. So this kind of tourism has been uh, seen as not really uh, helping you for a, a transformation or an enlargement of your experiences and of yourself. So as a result, the demand beyond such simple recreation and sightseeing has been increasing. And certainly now we see tourism coming back. It is increasing further. Niccolo Machiavelli, one of our biggest thinkers, in history is the source of the wonderful sentence, never let a good crisis go to waste. So the pandemic has provided us with the opportunity to restart tourism in a different way in the post-pandemic era. But maybe even more important is the fact that there is a necessity to change tourism as we are still in the climate catastrophe, which is not ending, which is actually unfortunately getting worse and where we have to uh, adapt to that if we want or not. And even uh, without a virus around, this is the number one reason why we have to be aware of the fact that there's no way back to the good old times, which were, as we just saw, not so good after all. So what is meaningful tourism? Meaningful tourism is a paradigm uh, developed for the post-pandemic development of global tourism. And of course, it is based on the concept of sustainable tourism and responsible tourism. The difference being that uh, one of the main aspects is that uh, meaningful Tourism is offering tools to provide quality and benefits for the aligned interest of all stakeholders, in, including the six main stakeholders groups, guests, host communities, employees, companies, governments, and the environment, aka future generations. So the two keywords here are alignment of interest and uh, taking care of all stakeholders. We talk a little bit uh, about this in a minute. So what are the foundations of meaningful tourism? You can see in the, in the graph. So there is, uh, first of all, positive 
sustainability an approach which is concentrating not on what to reduce, what to give up, what to forego, uh, or at least what you have to feel ashamed about in your tourism practices, but instead uh, concentrating on forms of uh, tourism which ensure benefits and satisfaction for all the stakeholders involved. And besides this, there is also positive psycho psychology, which was developed in the last 15 years or so, uh, talking about the well-being of people rather than just uh, curing uh, illnesses and uh, problems. And from that also, some colleagues have already started to publish papers on something called positive tourism. And of course, the experience economy, uh, hopefully remember Pine and Gilmore, which now has been moving onwards uh, to the transformational form of experience economy, saying that uh, you are traveling and really it changes you. So uh, meaningful tourism is not considering different stakeholders to be in competition with each other. So we see in many cases a discussion that we need, people say we need to balance uh, the interests of, for instance, the visitors and, and the hosts, uh, or we have to say, no, the, the hosts are uh, should be uh, deciding on everything, or we say, no, the market should uh, decide on everything, or saying, no, uh, better everybody stays home, so the environment is not uh, polluted anymore. Unfortunately, as we have seen, all these different forms of balancing or of uh, putting the interests of one stakeholder uh, in front of the others is simply not working. So what is needed is to find forms of alignment of interests, which result in higher quality of products, in better host guest relations, in improved working conditions and topic, uh, which is now, of course, very important as all over the world. Uh, tourism service providers find that they can't get their stuff back uh, because they found that they can have a, a better job or at least a, a job with the same level of payment for uh, Monday to Friday, nine to five, and uh, sitting down and less stress jobs. And they're all over the world. You can see if uh, the working conditions are not right, so these stakeholders are creating problems for tourism. And also, of course, uh, for the companies to provide higher margins, for instance, by having forms of tourism, which are not seasonal. So you can have 12 months a year customers and uh, forms of tourism where your customers are your best uh, marketing agents so that you have uh, recommendation marketing uh, saving you a lot of money you otherwise have to put in some kind of advertisement and uh, of course also that you can have regional and environmental development which helps you to get rid not only of seasonality but also of over tourism and of the overuse of the environmental resources so meaningful tourism thereby supports the mitigation of the climate catastrophe by providing benefits and satisfaction as a result of climate-friendly behavior of all stakeholders. So not saying what is forbidden, but saying what is the benefit, what will bring you satisfaction behaving in a climate-friendly way. So the uh, six stakeholders, just uh, to give you a, a graphic uh, impression here, are, as we said, travelers, the host communities, the employees working for tourism service providers or hospitality service providers, the companies themselves, the governments on the different levels from international to local, and the environment, again, the local one, and in the end, the global one. 
So the benefits, I will not go through all them, but you can see that uh, for different stakeholders, if you use meaningful tourism approach, uh, there is a lot of uh, positive benefits for everybody involved. And this is what you have to insist on in the development of uh, the tourism strategy for a company or for a destination that there are really benefits for everybody. Just uh, to make clear, what does it mean? Let, let's uh, use an example, which is the Komodo National Park in Indonesia, where this creature, as you can see on these photos here, are living. So this is based in Indonesia, or let's say two islands to the east of Bali, north of uh, Australia. And this park was initially established to conserve the Komodo dragon, uh, also known as the Komodo monitor, which is a lizard uh, and the biggest uh, lizard on, on Earth. Uh, they can be three meters long and they can be up to 70 kilos in weight. So they are actually hunting birds and then deer. They're also scavengers. And uh, if they survive the first few years, they can live up to 30 years. At the moment, there are about 3,500 of these animals still existing, and that's why they are listed on the endangered red list uh, of animals. They have been known and uh, have been uh, uh, been uh, the object of uh, curiosity already since more than 100 years in the Western world, and already in 1938, a nature reserve was started, which uh, developed finally in 1982 into a national park. So until now, the entrance fee for this park to see the, the Commodore Dragons was uh, about 10 US dollars for foreigners and just a few cents for Indonesians. And the visitors uh, can walk freely among the animals for this region, for these three little islands where the park is located. Uh, that is, of course, the major source of income for all the people, about 20,000 people living there. And uh, what happened was that during the pandemic, as everything, uh, also this park had to close for some time. And it was seen that uh, the dragons seemed to be much happier without so many human people uh walking around uh, so they became livelier they they produced uh, more offspring so scientists uh came to the conclusion that the animals are stressed by the large and increasing number of visitors so something has to be done about it the governor of uh, east nusa tengara who is responsible for the national park region uh, then came up with a solution which says simply uh, that the ticket price to go into the national park would be raised to 1,000 US dollars for a group of one to four visitors. So regardless how many people are in the group, uh, $1,000. That, of course, would uh, probably make the animals happier, but that would endanger the livelihood of the host community as much less tourists would come uh, who were willing to pay that level of entrance fee. But so the, obviously the plannings were more for luxury travel. So the airport uh, was uh, expanded, the harbor was redeveloped and uh, also some large uh, luxury hotels were started to be built. What happened? that the, the local people went on strike. And you could see there were demonstrations with a thousand people and many of them wearing a t-shirt where you had a, a Komodo dragon dressed like a government official with a briefcase full of money. And also as this rumor spread that the ticket price is already $1,000, many tourists canceled their bookings. So the fee hike was originally scheduled to take effect on August 
2022, but after the uh, demonstrations, it was postponed until January 1st and maybe will be postponed further. Still, the negative news and the confusion about the date when the new high entry ticket price will come into operation, uh, even uh, for this season already, had a very negative effect. So the government's argument was that the park had been poorly managed and you needed more resources for scientific research and also stopping illegal fishing and also poaching of these deers, which are uh, food for the dragons. Some environmentalists, however, claim that actually uh, the, the real uh, motivation for this policy was, was a plan to build some luxury hotels in the park and to earn money for the government from that. So that is a story which looks like many other stories where uh, the authorities try to find uh, solutions by either balancing interests or by taking in, uh, care of only the interests of some of the stakeholders. Obviously, the animals need additional protection, but pushing the local population into unemployment and misery will just increase the problem of illegal fishing and illegal poaching. And as these are three islands which cannot be fully uh, controlled, probably you, you would see uh, a lot of unlicensed and un regulated clandestine boat trips to enter the park uh, without a, any entrance fee, which then would let probably to uh, let, uh, lowering safety standards and accidents uh, and criminalization of local people and so on. And at the same time, many visitors to Indonesia, well, the majority, I'm afraid, would lose their chance to have a close encounter with this impressive beast, which uh, will also suffer in the end from this destabilization of the situation in the park. So uh, using the meaningful tourism paradigm, what would be a solution providing benefits for all stakeholders? So just an example, one way to solve the problem uh, would be to build an enclosure, maybe with glass walls, uh, a bigger one, like in a modern zoo, uh, with <clears throat> maybe a dozen or so of the lizards inside, and they will be changed every week, so they are not under much stress or only for a short time. Uh, and this is done by keeping or even reducing the current entrance fee level. Additionally, and this is basically not a bad idea, offering as an alternative for affluent travelers uh, that they will have to pay really $250,000 per person for a VIP visit for these small groups accompanied by a guide and that they will be still allowed to walk around freely among the lizards. And very importantly, uh, using the additional income not to put this into the coffers of the ministry in Jakarta, but to use it to train and support the upgrade of the services and the products by the local tourism service providers. So helping them to earn more with offerings of regional products, specialized cuisine, for instance, or uh, offering guided tours in different languages so that uh, they also uh, have their share from the upgrading of the tourism in the region and uh, also promoting the local culture in addition to the flora and fauna to provide also new business opportunities for local artists and artisans selling art and handicrafts and so on. So, then what would that mean for the six main stakeholders? Well, simply for the guests, uh, the lizards would still be accessible to the normal tourist. Uh, plus there would be a new luxury uh, immersive offer for those who can afford it and interested in it. For the host community, uh, they would get free training and support by the government. They would have more income but also more pride in offering their local culture so that the tourists are not just coming 
for the animals, but also to come to see what they have to offer. Uh, beside that, for the staff, and that would be the staff working for companies or also self-employed people, so they would get higher wages, higher income, again, more pride and uh, education, and they would have the opportunity that to learn new skills, which could be monetized through tourism. For the companies, again, more income, more and new opportunities to tap the luxury market and maybe some additional new companies uh, for art and handicraft or specialized food uh, could be started. The government uh, would get more tax from the income and more uh, income also from the tickets for the VIP tours and could use this funds to uh, increase the quality and uh, of the services and add a luxury tourism element to the tourism in that region and would have better possibilities to uh, control corruption. <clears throat> and finally, for the environment, uh, Varanus Gomoduensis would be better protected in their natural habitat, so having a greater chance to survive. And those put into the enclosure uh, with closer contact to the visitors, uh, they would probably need to endure this increased tension for maybe one week every five years, given the fact that there are more than 3,000 of these more than 3,000 of these creatures. Uh, I can't imagine that this will be such a bad thing compared to the situation they have been uh, living in uh, before the pandemic. And also, the marine life uh, would be better protected from fishing with explosives if the locals have other sources of income and don't have to do this illegal activity. So, Actually, the meaningful tourism paradigm requires not more than a change of perspective and an, an extension of the key performance indicators. So clearly not accepting any form of organization of tourism, which does not provide positive KPI results for all stakeholders or putting it in a positive form, creating forms of organization of tourism, which do provide positive KPI results for all stakeholders with the help of a positive sustainability approach. So that's all for the brief introduction. And now uh, let's move on with the webinar. So after the brief introduction into meaningful tourism, let's now have a quick uh, look back to the Meaningful Tourism Award 2022 which was given in uh, October 2022 in Singapore during the ITB Asia. And of course, the ebook we are celebrating today and the best practice examples we will see uh, briefly after this are all coming from applications and from winners actually from the Meaningful Tourism Award. So I have uh, a little presentation. I would like to share with you. So let's have a look at the Meaningful Tourism Award 2022. We had a panel discussion uh, and you can see the, the panelists uh, from left to right, uh, question rating, albatross expeditions and the tourism marketing organizations of Papua New Guinea and Mr. Kika, the boss of Visit Berlin, our sponsor. So we had uh, altogether 18 award winners because uh, the awards are given in gold, silver, and bronze for the six categories of meaningful tourism. So the travelers, the host communities, the, the employees, the companies, the governments, and the environment, the six stakeholders. And uh, here you can see, for instance, the representative of Albatross Expeditions uh, receiving her award. Of course, uh, no award can be done without a jury. And uh, we not only have to thank 
again, our sponsors, uh, Berlin Airport and Visit Berlin, but also uh, our jury members, which included, beside me, uh, Anita Chen, Paul Moxness, and Renuka Takora from Hong Kong, Canada, and the UK. So here you can see a uh, graphic presentation of, of the logos of all the award winners. And here you can see the complete list of the winners, gold, silver, and bronze on the left-hand side, the winners. And on the right-hand side for the categories, travelers and host communities, we also gave some honorable mentions because there was just so many very interesting and very positive applications that we felt that the jury felt that this should be done. And already here you can see what is also reflected obviously in the publication is that this is a wide variety of different organizations from the uh, kind of labor union for the Kilimanjaro porters uh, to five-star hot hotels and resorts from museums to tour guiding by homeless or formerly homeless people. So quite a lot of very, very different ones. So just to show you what happened in Singapore, and now we come to the main part of today's webinar, which are the six presentation of Meaningful Tourism Award winners who will share with us their best practice examples. And you can see the cover of the book, which is published today. And uh, so if you're interested, you can see the link if you go to payhip.com. Uh, of course, you're very welcome to purchase your copy. Hello again, and uh, I'm very happy now to welcome Lars von der Wettern from Singular Places, uh, a company based in Berlin, also one of the Meaningful Tourism Award winners 2022. So Lars, thank you very much for joining us. And uh, please, can you tell us about uh, what is Singular Places doing? Uh, how are you contributing to a better tourism, please. Thank you, Wolfgang, for, for having us, for giving us the platform. And also, just as we are connectors, and I will explain you why, I think it was also wonderful to be connected to meaningful tourism, thanks to you and our, our exchange, which I think is also when you look at the award winners, is where we feel especially inspired and honored to share with, with people who have had already so much positive impact in making our industry better and making travel better. That's what we are always putting as our slogan. So thank you, it, it's a real honor. Um, I've just, for the sake of, you know, maybe going through some points to give people an understanding what we are, prepare a few slides. Wouldn't like to make this a full slideshow session, but at least, you know, we, we can follow a little bit of guideline because at the end, um, what is very interesting when you also ask, what do you do and what is, what is your part in, in this, um, at the end, we are just connected, you know, and, and there is other green booking sites for hotels. So we didn't reinvent a wheel or anything here, but what we wanted to do is really give this positive inspiration and not lifting fingers. Like you shouldn't go there or a hotel should do this and that and that, but we wanted to connect and make you feel good, feel good on the host side but also for those impact-driven travelers to have a booking site and to create more community here. Yeah? And, and, and really having the luxury of connecting the best people and places. Yeah? And so there was obviously a vision and everything behind it, like you have to do for a good company. But what is the real message here is like, we wanted to have a big positive impact. And that is not to be arrogant, that is to really say we will put into more and more people's minds that this is the way to go. And not by the, the negative sense of education, but by the positive meaning of inspiration and finding inspiration on your journeys, you know? And we have specifically selected independent hosts because they needed this, especially after Corona, you know, less money for investment. Um, and we think they, they're often very humble 
They don't make the big noise on social media, but they do a lot better business practices very often than the big corporations that highlight all this brilliant stuff, what they do. So again, here we work with people, and that's also what we do. We connect the places, but also the people. So them and the team have more impact in the traveler than somebody like us from our little head office in Berlin. You know, and we don't have we have never rented an office. We don't plan to do so. We work all remote. Everybody can work where it's needed. We have our global ambassadors, which are relevant players in the industry anyhow. So there is no we are trying to obviously also look after our own imprint. Yeah? And then obviously we try to have a great team um, internally that, you know, equal opportunity is a, is a, is a big thing with a, in, within our industry, also on the senior levels and on the impact trip. So we want to have amazing experiences so that people also come back for more inspiration. At the end, this is about your trip. This is about your journey. You don't want to think in this moment, oh, maybe I can't have a bathroom because that will cost a lot of washing in the hotel or so. You want to have an amazing experience. And that's what we take care. But we filter the best places, making sure the money stays locally and that even once you are there, all the rest of your experiences are also local, are also meaningful, are also uh, in a positive way, enriching the community. So what is our statement? We can't do this alone. We are nobody, you know, in, in this meeting. But we have been given the luck to start connecting initially to what was planned for 25 places and friends. We have now grown all our IT structure to take 250. And on a, on, on a final level, we are looking at about 1,000 places, out of which about 350 will be places where we can host guests. So that this is the experience where you travel to, you have a local host welcoming you, you have a local host welcoming you with a team. So there's jobs created. These are all fair paid. The taxes are paid locally. No money of that stay is being taken. But at the same time, we have to be aware that this is a fight out there. This is a competition for the travelers. So we needed good tech partners. And this is what we wanted to give also to these independent hosts. You know, we have a relevant and very strong data protection is also another meaningful word here for us, for our travelers, you know, good CRM, the good CRS, which is decently uh, connectable because now talking 350 independent places, I guess uh, all the time, and most of the people in our industry understand what kind of software issues we're looking at. So we have done this, but at the end, we are nothing without the people pushing, putting the passion every day uh, from the traveler to take the time to select such a journey, but also having local travel experts helping you besides the hotel booking for all the transfers, the local experiences. So it, it, it's a very simple in our you know little circle, there is things. We want to give impact hosts a network of like-minded people because sometimes you feel also a little bit alone. You feel like a single fighter and we want to connect you to others. That gives energy and best practices. We also want to connect you to the travelers, those that look for these places and that look for experts who can help them to make sure their journey is wow and impactful. And then we want to be fair. This has to be economically viable and we shouldn't be ashamed of it. We want to be successful, we want to be making a lot of money, but it's limited. We're looking at a fair commission model. The company structure in the future is going to be built up that it doesn't depend on Lars sitting in Berlin. Uh, we're looking at steward ownership options where the power of the company and the purpose is protected uh, for the long term. And then in the future, we want to go even further and say we really want to help all our people with these best practices and openly measuring all the impacts that we are able to create around the globe. Um, what do we expect? We expect people that want to join us from the host perspective to be with a green heart, the sustainably even beyond uh, just the, the, the planting of trees, but to really be sustainable as a business, have this relevance in their community, this listening and giving exercise that we often discuss in meaningful tourism, you know, um, to be embodied, to encourage richness far beyond the, the actual building, to be singular, to be proud of this singularity, you know, to, to share your, your local features. And, and that can also be sometimes not just the beauty of everything, but the authentic experience, you know, something missing or whatever it is. And then it's a value-driven company overall. You know, we need people to really work with good values. And we are all, and that's the beautiful experience that we have. We have the very introvert person. We have the very crazy one. 
Uh, we have an amazing lady just working on the farm and, and somebody else helping her to get the hospitality going. But at the end, that is the beauty, you know, the singularity of the place and of the people. But the values at heart, the meaningful wish to really change them and to be better tomorrow than we have been today, that's what we expect. And that's what we call it an imperfect road, because we're not pretending that all our places are regenerative today. But we know that these are the places and people that are most likely getting the future. Yeah? And so that's what we call it an imperfect road. And once we have this base of a host around this community, the host then brings places on board, other industry players that in the region, very often they play together anyhow. And they would be the people that if you go to a place, you know, in Chile, and you would ask the host, where should I go? They would say, you know, oh, there's this very good restaurant. There's a super, this is our supplier for wine. This is the farm where we buy the cheese, you know, and this there is one museum experience, very authentic, run by the locals. You must see this, you know. And then that creates a teaser for you to understand there is much more to dive in in this region. But it also sh showcases that we really live circular economy. We're not just brainstorming about it. So now we have created much more than a hotel booking platform. We have already created the hotel booking platform, including the community and the circular economy. And what, what was a very important and final step for us was we don't enter a country where we don't have an ambassador, a person that we trust on values and that really knows the places because it wouldn't be sustainable if we travel to them. Some of them have two or eight rooms. I mean, just the flight out of Berlin going there and testing it, we, you know, we could never, never ever make up for that CO2 footprint. But so these ambassadors help us on the quality because we are going up notch. These are the most sexy places around the world. It's for inspiration at the moment, you know, to really showcase this. And then we link the last bit to the incoming people, the real travel heroes locally that help you for anything else you want to understand. Yeah? And bringing now the host, the place to stay, the local community, and for more insight, the travel expert really has created this partnership of for the goals as we, um, as we say, this is our strengths, you know? And how does it look in the future? This is already available. So the map is, is already there. You can choose, are you just looking for somewhere to stay? Are you looking to stay and taste? Or what experience can you find in the region? And the latest adding already live, probably just in a week's time, because in the back end it's already working, is next to this, we will showcase you the local expert, the faces of the people. You know, it's all about personal connections as well on this level. So independent businesses, it's good to see who, who is running it and, and who's going to be taking care of you during your trip. And that is a little bit of our story. We are bookable now. We are starting connecting the first places. And as of 23, as of January, we just, you know, need to move this into become a real sustainable and also successful financially uh, performing company. But um, we have no doubt we have now reached already 75 places and between places and ambassadors already over 100 people around the globe working on this project becoming bookable all the test was a pain but it's it's working and uh yeah we're looking forward to reach probably already by the end of next year uh the benchmark of 250 to 300 bookable places and then the community has reached um, already the um, the global connectivity of about 1,000 places because each of those bookable places brings their partners in front. Okay. And that's it. So we hope that we can inspire people when they travel, when they look for examples of good practices in hospitality or restaurants, come for inspiration to our site, you know, and reach out to our hosts, contact them and say, I found you on this website. I've seen you have an amazing concept going there, you know, being it from you know, natural pools to zero wastage to plastic free properties, whatever your subject is, wherever you need help. This is not a booking platform. This is a community that has come together to inspire others and overall make travel better. And that's okay. my story, which I hope came across not too much in a rush, but at least trying to bring a little bit more in depth. No, Lars, thank you very much. I think this is uh, uh, has been showing us uh, why you were awarded because this is exactly what I think what people are looking for. Uh, 
meeting people uh, for authentic experiences and and uh, having uh, a, a, a a fast way to find the, the right places and to have somebody helping you uh, to identify the places you want to go to. So maybe just one question you have been speaking about the ambassadors you have in each country. So for mm -hmm. people looking at it and say, hey, I want to be an ambassador for, for my country. So what is the process for you uh, in choosing ambassadors? Um, that's a good question because even people have asked, how do you choose even the places? You know, And, and that is the intriguing part, having started with an idea and then that idea has positively grown bigger there's a huge learning curve and the uh, initial luxury that we are having and still until today is that if somebody wants to be an ambassador very often there is somebody in between that connects us on the values so let's just give an example that somebody hears about this and speaks to you um, and you say yeah you're a good fit man you have been doing this in vietnam i've seen your projects i i, I know how you trying to showcase the beauty of Vietnam far away from mass tourism since a long time. I've seen you fighting for this when it was not yet, uh, you know, in the press every day about sustainable tourism. I will present you. That is, a, that is a great help. Or we reach out, we have a real discussion, which is not, you know, don't tell me about your CV, but tell me about your passion behind your values. And it will be different than mine, but but the bigger ones will connect. And, and that's how we select. And then it's always a panel decision. It's not Lars and somebody, but we will look at you. We will ask you questions, but also we want you to ask us questions because just as the places put a lot of trust in us, you helping us to find those places in your destination, that is a lot of trust for us because you will help us grow as a business. And yet we have to prove you that we can also help you. So we see this as a win-win over the long term. Uh, or midterm, actually, we don't believe just in long term, I think. So ambassadors, it's more if you feel comfortable that you are a real fighter for making travel better, we want to hear about you. We want to meet you. So so your approach is uh, not so much in uh, looking at certification where people fill out forms and say what they're doing, but by really people knowing really the places. And uh, so it's not a a bureaucratic process, but a process, a uh, people-oriented process, if I understand that right. Uh, you said this absolutely beautiful. I'm very passionate about this because I once said the, the, the phrase, and I don't want to sound, you know, I, I don't want to say that there isn't a good certification. I think certifications have a, a role to play in the path of other companies to sustainable practices because they can be inspiring. They can get you started. And this is a good step. But I have seen too many of our hosts already playing on a higher level. They are so busy doing the good every day that they don't have time to fill out and post about it in social media and give themselves green little flowers on every picture. It's not that I say the others are doing bad. It's just that most of our people have done a much more practical approach. And that's what we want to see in you. You know, get it going. Because there's other great booking platforms for certified properties and, and go there if you want. And that's cool. You know, I'm not saying this is bad. But we want to have a different approach, which you yeah, perfectly described. Thank you very much for pointing that out. Okay. I'm afraid that's all we have time for. So mm -hmm. thank you very much. And uh, well, you can uh, you, you have the information about the, the contact or otherwise just uh, search for singular places uh, on Google. And uh, I hope that this is uh, inspiring also some people. Uh, to, to work with you and to think about how can they join such a uh, meaningful community. Thank you, Lars, and uh, all the best. Thank you very much. And obviously to all those who are out there listening with the interest to make our industry better. All the best. Thank you. Thank you. And now I'm very happy to welcome Peggy Roden to us. And uh, she is working with the company with locals. And uh, so thank you all for being with us, taking the time. Great, uh, thank you so much for the introduction. So with Locals is an online platform and marketplace that um, aims at connecting people and cultures from all over the world. So with Locals um, started um, back in 2013 uh, with our founder, Willem, who was traveling all around Asia, and he was doing different kinds of tours and experiences, 
And he really noticed a problem in that a lot of the, the guides were very restricted on what they had to show and say. Often they had scripts and um, they were not really showing what they wanted to show. And apart from that, um, he realized that the guides that were working very hard were just getting a small percent of the money that the guests were paying to do these trips. So he wanted to give an opportunities to locals all over the world to advertise themselves and their own experiences and have direct contact with guests. So that's exactly what he did. And with locals was launched back in 2013. And we really want to focus on creating travel experiences with people, places and planet in mind. And it's come a long way since then. Um, we now have what we call with locals originals. Um, so those are kind of tour themes that we create and we put multiple hosts on one tour theme. So here you can see, for example, 10 tastings food tour or a bike tour or off the beaten track. And um, the hosts on these uh, tour themes are not given very restricted scripts and they're not given very restricted itineraries. There's just a few kind of uh, USPs to follow. And aside from that, we want to give it over to the host to show things their way, as we believe, you know, it's their city and their experiences. Who are we from the Netherlands headquarters to tell our local hosts how to run things? And a really cool thing about with locals as well is that once a guest goes onto the experience that they're interested on, they can choose their local host. Um, so as I mentioned, there's multiple hosts to choose from and a guest can pick on a host profile and there's going to be a video most times of the host introducing themselves and a bio about them and a little about their interests, which means the guests can really choose a host that they feel that they would get on really well with. And this also contributes to creating this really good connection. And we kind of like to think going on a with locals tour is kind of like hanging out with a new friend. Um, and aside from that, it's worth mentioning that on all these tour themes, there is uh, trainings. So the, the host has to go through a certain training uh, to be allowed onto the tour. And you can also see here that the, the guest reviews are always available. Uh, so people can see you know, what other people think of these hosts. So a little bit of an overview of with locals um, we're live in around 100 destinations across the world and uh, tour length varies from kind of two to 12 hours. Also, all the emissions of the tours are offset. Um, we have a fair commission structure, uh, which ensures the, the hosts are always earning a fair amount uh, for the work that we do, but also that with locals um, gets enough to be able to keep running and empowering these local hosts um, to do what they love through these tourism experiences. Aside from that, um, we aim to give back to the local economies through including budgets on the experiences which the hosts can take people to, to local establishments. And we also like to um, think of our hosts as kind of micro entrepreneurs. We really want to give them the power um, to do things in their way. Um, so I'm going to go in a little bit of detail onto these things and explain a bit more about how with locals leads um, responsible experiences. These are our five pillars in terms of our uh, responsible pillars. And I'm going to go through each one just now. And um, so the first is to respect local culture. Um, we believe it with locals um, that uh, traveling is all about a cultural exchange, um, mostly a guest coming to uh, a destination and really getting to know about the, the history and culture. And this is really best done close up through immersion. That's why we want to make kind of these immersive, really local experiences um, so we can really create a proper cultural exchange. And we also think this is important because this cultural exchange really leads to kind of more um, peace because once we get to know really more about each other, really spending time with a true local, we can more understand the, the differences um, in these cultures. And aside from that, we believe that um, our travel experiences can really lead to actually preserving cultures. Um, cultural preservation is not only done through the memories of those who own it, but also uh, from an outsider coming in and appreciating it. We really want to help encourage 
uh, the locals want to hold on to their culture and keep it for as long as possible um, so that those travelers can come and enjoy it. So with locals really works to preserve culture, work with cultural exchange and also respect culture by creating truly authentic experiences. This means doing things that the locals would do, going to local marketplaces, going to the local neighborhoods and um, seeing things as a local and not necessarily as a tourist. Aside from that, we also contribute to respecting culture by really educating the hosts on the importance of this and you know, the need for them to be proud of their culture and to keep it. Um, as I mentioned, we also put the, the host in the driver's seat. They're the decision makers. They're our key stakeholders. We always have open communication with them and listen. Um, we also discourage any sale of, important, of imported goods um, through our training. And we also have a, a blog space for the, the guests um, in which we try to put as much material as possible on traveling responsibly, respecting cultures, and so on. Um, so the next principle is to avoid <clears throat> and prevent overcrowding. So there's a few things that we do um, to contribute towards this. The first, I think it's really important part of with locals is that we only offer private experiences. So that means no big groups with the flags and the microphones, like overcrowding a city. Um, the max amount of people on a with locals tour is eight. But normally, because it's private, it's two to three people. And that also really contributes to the, the host and guests really getting to know each other on a personal level. And it also allows for all the experiences to be personalized around the guest wishes as it's private. On top of that, we try to offer experiences as much as possible out of the touristic center. And we want to encourage uh, tours in more local neighborhoods, which could also really benefit from, from, from more tourists and kind of spread out you know, this overcrowding in the center. And we're also looking at opening um, lesser known destinations and uh, we just opened recently in the last months uh, a lot of uh, Balkan cities, as we really want to encourage you know, people visiting not only the Venices of the world. And um, we really want to educate guests again through these um, aspects on our blog, as shown before. Um, so we do this uh, through a fair pay analysis. And um, so every year we analyze the pay to the hosts and benchmark it with inflation and other factors to make sure that they're always earning a fair amount for the work that we do. they do. Uh, we also have policies in place to protect the hosts and make sure that they're fairly treated and feeling valued. On top of that, we do send out surveys uh, to the hosts to, to check how happy they are with everything and adapt when they, when they might um, feel that we could improve in areas. Uh, we also offer a flexible schedule for the hosts, so they're really in charge of when they take bookings, when they're available, and it's all up to them. And we try to give as much opportunities as possible beyond uh, just the, this kind of tours in the cities, um, especially in COVID times, this is important, and I will show you a few examples in a moment. Um, we also uh, contribute to providing quality employment through always hiring locally. Um, for us, that means speaking the local language and living in the destination for at least two years and um, also protecting hosts, as I mentioned, through these uh, specific policies. And we also provide education um, to our hosts through our education center. These are a few examples of opportunities that we've offered the, the hosts aside from, from just the tours. And um, during COVID times, we launched online experiences. And uh, which were really popular, you know, these were workshops, cooking classes, um, playing music, whatever it may be, depending on the host skills, uh, these could be offered online. And also, for example, of course, with remote work, a lot of businesses wanted a, a reason to kind of connect with each other. And with Locals was a solution for this. Um, we did kind of cultural events uh, for teams and companies um, to be able to enjoy and the hosts were able to, to earn money through this as well. Here's a quick overview of our learning center for the hosts. Um, as I mentioned, they need to go through certain trainings uh, to get onto the tour themes as we really know the importance of providing quality experiences. So they need to pass quizzes to get onto these. There's also specific sustainability training 
and as well as you can see in the top right training um, in order to be successful on our partners such as Viator, TripAdvisor, Airbnb and Get Your Guide, um, which also helps them get more bookings as well. And the sustainability training uh, was quite a lot of work went into that uh, to establish what SDGs were in focus on our tourism experiences. Um, and the training was created around these SDGs um, through, through videos, um, which are very kind of fun and easy to follow. And then a quiz at the end, which they need to get 100% pass to be able to actually finally pass the, the sustainability training. Uh, we feel this is really important because we have over 1,500 hosts and, um, you know, we cannot micromanage every aspect of all the experiences, especially because we give them freedoms. So we feel that training is really important around sustainability to make sure that they kind of know what the standards are and um, do good by with locals in that sense. And uh, next, of course, we want to give back to, to local economies out with just uh, the hosts. Um, so we um, ask the hosts to always include local um, so kind of suppliers in, into their tours, like restaurants and maybe for some transportation. And um, we offer often quite some budgets on the experiences for them to take the guests to these places. Uh, for example, our 10 tastings food tour, um, you know, 10 tastings is in the name. And also it visits normally six local establishments and restaurants. And also through our training, uh, we encourage the, the host to make good decisions in terms of, you know, having good um, human rights um, processes and also encourage them to visit places that have recycling in place, reduce plastic and so on. Uh, our fourth uh, responsible travel principle is around about protecting the natural environment. Um, for with locals, we actually have a lot of very low impact tourism experiences is they're normally walking um, or a few biking. And we only have around about 20% of the experiences that are done by vehicle. A lot of these, we do try to do it by train as well. Um, so we do in general makes not so negative impacts um, just through our, our tourism experiences. We also have policies in place um, to protect animals. Uh, we have very strict rules on no up close personal experiences with animals, uh, we really want to respect their rights in that sense. And for our day trips that do often go on to more natural areas, there's specific training for that and um, for the hosts and uh, to really encourage the guests to visit them and respect them, you know, never leaving any litter, sticking to the paths, uh, respecting the rules of national parks and so on. And we've also put some of our philanthropic efforts this year to um, protecting the natural environment as well. And finally, um, we are 100% carbon neutral. Um, so all of our emissions are calculated and offset uh, through gold standard projects with our partner Choose. And right now the projects are mostly on uh, clean energy. So that's a little bit of an overview about with locals, who we are and how we work towards responsible and meaningful tourism. Wow, thank you very much. That is uh, very impressive. And uh, uh, you can see that from a small initiative. Now you are saying you have more than 100 uh, cities already covered. Uh, so maybe just one question. So uh, these guides are uh, not full-time guides, as far as I understand. They do this as a part-time activity. Uh, or, or are they are they uh, developing into full time guides? So it depends on the. There are full time guides out there in our busier cities and our most popular hosts. They only do with locals. They can make a full time um, career out of it and do nothing on the side. So it depends on their you know agendas if what their other things are are going on. Of course, in quieter destinations and off season. Maybe they would need something else to substitute it, but but we can do it uh, full time. But it's not the you're not saying okay they should uh, do this only no. sometimes so they keep the fresh approach or something like that. No, it's come there. So they're, it's completely up to them. They're they're basically freelancers and they manage their own schedule and uh, how much time they want to dedicate to it. I see. I see. So 
thank you very much for for sharing uh, this experience with us. So, what are the next plans of uh, uh, your company? So, you you are planning to uh, have even more cities uh, in, in your catalog? Exactly. Yeah, uh, we're going to be uh, growing in the next years, opening uh, more cities. And also to those kind of more we call secondary cities or quieter ones to try to, you know, spread tourism to more areas. And in terms of sustainability, we're going to be um, publishing an impact report next year uh, to be able to be more transparent about our impacts and also looking into the tours and um, not only how we can, you know, minimize negative impacts, but really create more positive impacts through our tours and experiences as well. Very good. Thank you very much. And uh, again, thanks for uh, joining us. Uh, and so all best wishes to you. And uh, for all, everybody watching this, uh, that is certainly a good idea for your next trip uh, to join the tour with, uh, uh, with locals. Exactly. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Bye-bye. Bye. Welcome back, and now I'm uh, really happy to introduce Mr. Raj Yoshi to you. Uh, so he is the founder and the owner of the Adventure Boutique, and he is doing some very special kind of uh, offers for different ways on traveling in uh, lesser traveled areas. And... Uh, he also has been uh, among the uh, group of uh, award winners of the Meaningful Tourism Award. Uh, and uh, so thank you, Raj, for taking the time uh, to, to be with us. And uh, you told me that we will start by looking at a short video to introduce uh, what your company is doing. So let's look at the video first. And then, Raj, please, after that, tell us a bit more about uh, what is the idea and the history of your company and of the services you offer. So let's start with the video. And after that, Raj, please, it's up to you. Um, let me tell you what I, I have done in this world. Thank you very much, Wolfgang. It's a privilege for me to speak to you today. So as you kindly introduce me, I'm Dr. Raj Joshi. I'm the founder and also an exhibition leader for the Adventure Boutique. We offer adventure travel all around the world. Now, to me, we have that strong ethos of adventure. So in all of our trips, in all of our expeditions, there's got to be some sort of challenge for our clients. I believe that's really important. Myself and my company, we're part of an organization called the Transformational Travel Council. I'm, a, I'm also honored to be an ambassador for them. And I like their ideology where all 
our travels should have some meaningful purpose where we induce some sort of positive transformation in our clients, in the people who travel with our companies. Now, I think if people have that meaningful transformation, not only do they have such a beneficial effect to their own being inside, but to me, it gives them a platform, a foundation from which they can go on to help other people. I think that's really important. So I think the idea of travel, the real power behind travel is in a nutshell to make a world a better place. So how we try to create that through the Venture Boutique is as well as offering high quality expeditions, which are gonna be adventurous and fun for the clients and also challenging. We want the people to come with an open mind, to have that transformation inside, but then through that journey, what they've experienced from our, our trip, it's not for the short term, it's for the long term. So they then go back to their own homes, reflect, and then use that as a launching pad to go on to help others. And I've seen that happen through our journeys, through our trips. I've seen people have a positive transformational effect just for themselves, whether it's uh, coming back. I've had uh, clients feedback to me to say how just that experience they've had with us, um, overcoming the challenges and obstacles and immersing themselves in the local culture, which is really important, local interaction with the communities. They now have come back as a more positive person. Uh, for instance, uh, one person who was a, a manager who came out of meetings quite stressed and frustrated now sees a bigger picture. She comes out now more relaxed and thinks, what's all the bickering about? What's the point? So in a way, we've changed her perspective, her attitude, and she's incorporated that into a daily life in a positive way. So that's just one example. Other examples then, which lead on to how my clients go on to help others. Uh, for instance, one of our, our trips, so our trips, we do uh, some iconic trips, which people may have heard of, and we also do some trips which are very niche. And to me, that's what I like to do, is to create niche expeditions in a way where no one else goes to, because a country is special, I think, due to its people. And there are countries there which are relatively unexplored or or we have little understanding about the people. We might have uh, a stereotypical image seen in the media. We don't really know who those people are and what they're about. So an example is Sierra Leone. So for example, I take groups over to Sierra Leone. It's to climb the highest mountain there called Mount Bintamani. But to me, that climbing the mountain is just a small part of the expedition. It's that whole journey through the country and through meeting the people and interacting with the local communities, which is really important. So an example of this expedition is what we do after we land in Sierra Leone in Freetown, which is in the west of the country. We travel right through the heart of the country over into the east to where the Loma Mountains are, where Mount Bintamani is situated, actually in the middle of the jungle in the primary rainforest. But along the journey, um, I have an organic process, really, where I, I take the group and we stop off during the journey at a hospital called Masanga Hospital. Mm -hmm. Now, this hospital is in a remote area surrounded just by villages, gets very little government support. And what I do is I take the clients there. We actually overnight at the hospital. So I use the facilities of the hospital and then pay them so they get some income for for housing us and feeding us. But then they actually show our clients around the, the hospital. They, with the blessing of the local people, they meet the local communities, meet the patients, meets the staff who are working there, and they get to understand who these people are, what they're about, what difficulties they face, you know, what joys they have in their life, what their hopes and dreams are for the future. And then from there, we carry on our journey into the jungle. And then finally, after a few days in a beautiful jungle, we climb the mountain. But that's going through some amazing local communities. Again, 
we we never impose ourselves on local people so we've got to go through three uh, tribal lands to get into the jungle and each of the 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 land has a chief so we have to liaise with each of the chiefs and if they say we can't pass through we simply can't pass through so it's a real adventure and my groups like that they know that we don't know what's going to happen next but thankfully um with um with that interaction which is really really quite special with the local people we haven't had any problems so far with the local chiefs or the communities and in fact we've been invited into their homes and shared a rich cultural experience but following from that trip with the local interaction and the challenge of climbing the mountain my group come home and then they say how can we help the hospital so we identify i communicate with the hospital i identify what they want and what they require and as well, we were there. So we've done our own assessment with our own eyes. We met the people and see uh, firsthand what's going on there and what their needs are. And as a result, um, not so long ago, my group kindly donated a lot of their own money, as well as through our charity, which is the Adventure Booty Foundation. Um, other people donated their money kindly or had events where they, they raised money. Mm. And from this and from my group, who instigated this uh, during the expedition, uh, we raised thousands of pounds to actually buy oxygen concentrators for the hospital. So only quite recently, we delivered 36 oxygen concentrators, which fulfills a requirement currently for the hospital, which is really, really um, um, important for the local people. And then after this is done, it hasn't ended there. One of the group members has said to me, Raj, uh, what next he kindly donated thousands of his own money for this and he just said raj what else do they need so we're currently liaising with the hospital now and they're looking at the new sterilization unit because they've actually increased the number of operations they're doing and they have no way or or adequate facilities to properly sterilize their equipment with the increase in operations so that's our next project so to me that's the real meaning and the power of travel is the good you can do around the world so i think helping other people but in my own altruistic way as well, I believe that there's a lot of fighting which goes wrong in the world. And some of these people have never spent even five minutes probably chatting with that person from that country or from that culture or that background. So what's really nice is people who never get the opportunity to meet. I have that two-way, what I like to see, educational process where I think we learn a lot from the local community whom we meet. And hopefully they learn a little bit from us. But by that interaction, I think we we foster that understanding of one another, of um of the fellow human being, and hopefully then there'll be less ignorance in the world and less hatred, and I think in some small way the world can be a better place. Yes, thank you so much for sharing this with us. I think this is a very powerful example, also of what what we mean when we talk about meaningful tourism. That this is something where it is uh, their benefits for your clients. You say they change their the way they see the world and they how they organize their own life, but it also <clears throat> changes positively the situation of the people in the area you're, you're, you're traveling. And, and this is something which I think, uh, especially uh, tourism in low-income countries often has been accused of being a modern form of uh, colonialism. It's just so it's still the black people have to work for the white people and it just now uh not because there's a gun pointed at them but because they pay the money uh but it's still and i think this is a very good example it doesn't have to be like that and and you you give obviously in your work uh, before your groups you give the local people a name and a face and a story and and it's not just a maasai uh warrior jumping up and down for a nice uh, instagram photo and I think this is something uh, really, really interesting. And uh, I think uh, we can all be happy that people like you spend their time and their efforts on, on such uh, uh, meaningful projects. And I think you have a little video which is uh, showing more information about the, the hospital and some impressions of the hospital. So maybe uh, to, to end uh, uh, today's little uh presentation so we can have a look at this other video of you if that's okay that's right uh, thank you uh very much once again wolfgang 
I'll now play the video. And this is actually our expedition. It's just highlights from expedition in Sierra Leone to climb Mount Bintamani. But it includes the journey, which is, I think, the important uh, part of any expedition, not just reaching the summit of the mountain. It's that whole journey. And you'll see that, including Masanga Hospital, uh, who we're supporting. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, safe trips for you and your clients and uh, also all the best wishes for the people you're you're meeting. Thank you, Raj, and uh, have a good time uh, for your next trip, which I think starts tomorrow. <laughs> That's right. Less than 24 hours, I fly to Uganda. Wow. Uh, okay. So, so thank you for taking the time to be with us. And we, to finish, we have a look at the video. And Raj, goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. The part that will always live with me is actually going to Masanga Hospital and each of us giving blood um, and my blood being used only one hour after I've given it uh, to help uh, a three-year-old boy who come into the hospital with severe malaria. <laughs> going to hike the mount the highest mountain of west africa mount bintumani me of what the Buddhists say about happiness and they say there's no way to happiness happiness is the way and that's so true the whole path up there the sweating the suffering the, the landscape um, is the happiness um, it's not getting up there uh, although that will be a great reward to be up there We have as our next guest, uh, Chris Grime, and he is the head of product integration of small luxury hotels of the world. And uh, so, Chris, thank you very much for being with us and taking the time to share some information about your organization. Thank you very much. Thanks. Okay. For and I think, well, let's go right into it. And... Uh, Tell us uh, how it developed and uh, what you're doing, and uh, of course, maybe about the future. Okay. So yeah, we um, launched the program in October 2021. Um, the we we've been planning this for a, a number of years, um, and part of the conf part of the challenge for us was finding a simple path to make things palatable 
uh, both to our hotels and to customers. So we looked at all sorts of certification, green key, green this, green that, and it was very confusing. And from a customer point of view, incredibly confusing. You know, I think we found over 250 different certification bodies. So we got in touch with the Global Sustainable Tourism Council that we just came across um, and had a few conversations with them and, and realized that this was, this was basically the basis, the criteria for GSTC was the basis for pretty much all these certification bodies. Um, so that's what we used as our template. Um, what, you know, we didn't want to reinvent the wheel. We wanted to use something that was already there, already been discussed by academics, by interested parties. Um, and so we created three pillars of our own based on the GSTC criteria. So our three pillars are environment, culture, and community. And I think the thing that was at the heart of our, um, our, our organization is that our hotels are small. They are luxury properties, but they're all small. And so a real common feature of the hotels is that they are local. They're locally owned, locally managed. The staff mostly are from the local area. Um, and it just meant that we felt whilst our hotels were really strong on culture and community because of that, perhaps the one element that they weren't as strong at was the environmental side. So we needed to help them find a way to improve that. Um, but as a starting point, having a lot of buildings uh, within the hotels that are small, that are repurposed buildings, so they're not brand new concrete structures that have been built. Um, the, the, the building materials are local, the fabrics that they're using are local, the produce that they're using, organic, seasonal, local, all these things automatically sit very comfortably in the world of sustainability. Um, so, it seemed like the most logical thing to do that we would create a, a collection from within our, we've got over 500 hotels. Whilst we want all of them to take further steps on their journey, however, whichever stage they're at um, with sustainability, we wanted to also celebrate those who are going above and beyond um, the, the norm. And the ones that are really um, examples to our hotels and to other people uh, to aspire towards. So we, the aim will be eventually that we would love it if all our hotels were, were in the considerate collection. But the reality is a combination of location, style of hotel, age of hotel, the things that can be done, retrofitting, sustainability is not always easy in all the properties. Um, so... Yeah, we, we want everybody to progress along the sustainability journey, but the, the considerate collection will be something that celebrates the best of the best. So we launched, first of all, in October 2021. And at that point, we launched with 26 properties. Um, they were all existing SLH members. Um, a year on from that, we now have 48 uh, hotels uh, in 26 countries. Um, a combination of existing hotels and new hotels that have been attracted in by what we're trying to do. And that was the whole purpose. We wanted to create a, a club, for want of a better way of putting it, to share knowledge. Um, we, and we tried to make sure that hotels engage with each other. We try and connect general managers from similar hotels. For example, we've got two properties in Bali, massively different in style, but both are... Um, very much entwined with their, their local community. And so have a lot of things in common. And so we've connected the two general managers together. They are talking about the things that they've done already, the things that they can do. But I think the beauty of the sustainability area is that I think most of us who are in it don't feel as that we're in competition. And I shouldn't say that because I'm, I'm representing small luxury hotels of the world, but I look at other people doing things and I go, that's great. I, I, I applaud it because um, and so I think it's quite good that people look at it and don't, they don't feel as if they're protecting their own area of what they're doing. They feel happy to share what they're doing. Um, and that's what we've got to do. If, uh, you know, if, if, we, if tourism is to have any, any future without destroying the very thing that people are going to see, we've got to do this and we've got to do it now. Um, so that was the premise on, on why we set things up. 
and how we're moving it forward. So we've 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 got a, a, a process, a selection process, and our own green team that assess any hotel that is interested in, in joining the considerate collection. And then once a hotel has passed that stage, uh, we then get um, somebody from GSTC to look over the document um, that we've produced. And it's not, it's not certification. We're very careful to say that we're not a certification body. We're not experts in this field. What we're trying to do is help our properties tell a story and, and help customers feel connected to, to the thing, the places that they're going. Um, so yeah, that was, that's the premise behind it, but we've also produced a number of things um, in-house so we've got a, an intranet system, and within there, there are um, a number of things that people can, resources that hotels can look at. Um, and again, it depends on, on what level they're at. Some people are way past removing straws and plastic bottles, um, and let's hope everybody is, but you know, we know the reality is, is that some people are still, still struggling to, to, to get on that, for, on, and to know what to do as much as anything else. I mean... One classic example, we had a seminar for all our hotels and we were, we were, we're in a strange situation. In the past, we used to be saying, um, you're, yeah, in your bathrooms, you should have more choice. We're a luxury brand. You should have lots of different things in there. Now, 10 years down the line, we're going, don't do that. Don't have, you know, have refillable bottles, have this, have that, but, but, but have things that are sustainable, uh, not things that are single use. And um, we had one of the hotels who, who, who popped up a question and said, but how can that be luxury um, if, if, you're, if, we're, if we're doing this? And I said, the thing is, is luxury is a very much a perception. Um, and if you explain why you're doing something, people will have no problem with it. So if you say, we used to have single use bottles of shampoo and soaps and things and people used to take away with them. We don't do this now and this is why we don't do it and actually no, there's nobody there's nobody who's ever come back and said well that's you know i don't like that we should have everything like we used to have it um so it's a kind of a it's a, a shift in mentality for for our hoteliers but it's also an opportunity to help educate travelers who may not have seen it before or may have seen it and just need um affirmation that the the product that they've bought is something that they, they're not going to feel um, a prick of conscience um, when they leave. They're not going to go and go, oh, my goodness, I've just consumed everything that, that I could possibly could in a very short period of time. It's how can we do things a little bit better? So things that maybe hadn't even been thought of before with luxury products, um, vegetarian um, options, not just options, whole menus that are vegetarian based. So we, we've got a hotel, one of the hotels I mentioned before, that or the, the areas, which is in Bali, which is called Los Lindenberg. Now, their entire menu is vegetarian and vegan. And I think if you'd have said to somebody 10 years ago that a luxury property would have a 100% vegetarian or vegan menu, they would have said you were mad to try it. This place is attracting people, maybe a different type of clientele, but it's a really significant thing for them. And, and it's been a significant thing for the chefs because a lot of the chefs in the area of the local people they're not using a lot of meat the, the meat is an expensive product so they're actually they're cooking a lot of things with vegetables so they've had an opportunity to be involved in the creation of gardens the 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 you know, the supply lines they've, they've been able to uh, ensure that the supply lines are such that they're going from local people producing local vegetables and, and they're able to go to these farmers and say, this is what we need. And this is when we need it. And it's not a pressure situation because what we, we don't want, we don't want, I mean, Bali is probably a bad example because they don't have a season quite like some places, but we want seasonal produce to be used. In, in, and I think that's what we should all be doing. We shouldn't be having what we want when we want it. Um, we should have a varied diet by eating what's seasonal at the time in the place where we are. Um, so, in this particular case, they've adapted traditional Balinese um, um, uh, menus using sort of some Western culture um, and Western um, uh, approach. 
um, to, to create a, a very exciting dish and probably not quite as spicy as they might do for uh, the local market. Um, so there's, there's, that's, that's something that has happened and, and is evolving with all the hotels, something we're encouraging. Um, another thing that we've done is we've brought in a 50 point sustainability section to our quality inspection uh, process. So part of small luxury hotels of the world is that all our hotels are inspected every year by a mystery inspector. It's an unannounced visit. Um, and we've incorporated 50 questions into that process that are specifically related around sustainability. But not necessarily, it's, so it's not, the, it's not the, the back house side of, of sustainability, it's the front of house stuff. Because I think we don't just need to be green, we need to be seen to be green, um, and, but not green washing. So we need all the back office uh, elements to be done, but we also need to show the customers that actually you don't need a, a plastic bag in every waste paper basket. Because when they go back to their offices and their homes, um, wherever they might be, then they might go, hang on a minute, well, that's a hotel that's doing that. So if they can do it, then I can do it. Um, the, 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 the idea of, of a lot of our hotels are now giving a metal water bottle when, when people first um, um, uh, sign into the hotel. And that, you know, the, the number of plastic bottles um, I mean, I'm going to come on to a hotel later on because I know they won an award uh, through your organisation, but Alinta in Phuket, they've saved 1.3 million tonnes of plastic bottles from going into recycling because now they don't allow, and this has been happening for quite a long time, but this is what they're doing. Um, they don't allow any onto property. Um, so things like that, providing... Um, glass bottles uh, in the dining rooms with water instead of and, and purifying the water on property. These are all things that most hotels in our sector can do um, and, and, and they are doing. And those are the sort of things that our mystery inspection are, are looking at. Um, and like I say, they're not going into the kitchen to ask whether the, the, the food waste is being, is being handled correctly um, because it's a mystery inspection. So that would be crazy. But we want to make sure that the hotel is aware that this is what customers are actually seeing. And this is an important factor uh, to make sure that, that they're, they're showing their green credentials, um, you know, on the surface. Um, the other things that we've done as an organization, we, we've partnered with an environmental charity called Tree Sisters. Um, so Tree Sisters is an organization that as a business, as an industry, um, certainly in, in the UK anyway, our industry is dominated by women. And Tree Sisters is a, um, a charity that empowers women. Um, it's managed locally by women. The idea behind it is that they are, they are replanting trees in, in forested areas around the equator because obviously that's one of the biggest impact areas. Um, so there's a number of sites, but basically anytime anyone book, books on what's our, our sort of a uh, customer loyalty program, which is called Invited. Anytime someone books on there, there is a contribution made. There's a tree that is planted through Tree Sisters. So we've done that. Um, we've also just arranged a partnership with Weaver. So Weaver's quite new. So if anybody um, is not familiar, it's a sustainability management platform, but it's born out of a group of people who works with smaller properties in Africa, predominantly, that's their, their background. And one of the things we found is that a lot of sustainability management systems are really fantastic for big hotels and big business. But for small properties, it's an administrative nightmare. They just don't have the resource to do it. Um, and also a lot of those platforms don't really have a community element to it, which is something that our properties and small properties in particular is are particularly strong on. Um, so we've just signed that partnership. It's literally just been announced yesterday. So hot news. Um, and so that's another thing that we're doing. Um, but maybe if I can just finish off by giving you some examples based on the hotel that won an award. So you'll you, obviously you'll know plenty about this hotel, but um, Alinta in Phuket. So they do lots of different things. Um, They've got a, an organization called, um, I think it's Blue Found, I mean, Pure Blue, Pure Blue. 
And Pure Blue Foundation does a lot of work with local charities, including fisheries departments, and um, uh, in trying to restock uh, the reefs with with reef fish. Um, they do things that the staff really really get inv involved in, which is things, things like simple things like community beach cleanups. Um, but it's actually the staff that organise that, and they get local people involved. Um, and the, you know that this is an area somewhere like Phuket is an area where they know their livelihood is dependent on their environment. You know, people don't want to come to a beach covered in plastic. So if it's not clean, people won't come. Um, so they're really invested in it, and they they the hotel actually go out to local schools on a regular basis and do talks about um, food management and waste management of food. Uh, um, uh, Water things to, to help uh, save water because obviously in that particular area there are some challenges with keeping pure water. Um, um, they also um, have planted a vegetable garden at a local school and helps them change their their menus to improve the nutritional balance of of, of the food that's being provided in the school. Um, and they've got local staff at all levels, so the, the the community and the hotel are absolutely intrinsically linked. Um, and that's the sort of thing that we're, we're, we're encouraging. And they've done, they've done all sorts of other things that you wouldn't necessarily think of. But I think of going to certain beach resorts in the world and you see acres of white plastic uh, on the beach. Well, uh, Aline to Phuket, they've, all their beach furniture now, they've, they've upgraded it to marine grade stainless steel. So not only is it long lasting, um, it's attractive, um, and it's recyclable. So these are the sort of things that, uh, and, and you know, this is one where obviously their upfront investment was quite high, but the long-term benefits of that are, are, are massive. Um, so yeah, um, hopefully in a nutshell, I've, uh, I've given you some of the things that we're trying to do to try and progress our sustainability journey. Yes, Chris, thank you so much. I think that was uh, quite impressive. Uh, and clear, clearly uh, pointing out that, that luxury is not just uh, uh, expensive or, or bling bling, but uh, today luxury really means investing in the future in the, in the long term things. And uh, the, the, the property in Phuket you mentioned, uh, uh, this is of course also uh, featured in the, the, the ebook uh, we, we are publishing uh, at the same time as we do the webinar and there are some more examples of what you have been saying that they have uh, their own gardens or their for their herbs and the vegetables for their own kitchen but also as you mentioned for for the school kids in the area so that this is a really good example of uh, involving the community involving the staff members and that is not just a crazy idea of, of the director but that really everybody is into it so uh, that is that is I think uh, a, a really good uh, example. And uh, as, as you mentioned, uh, so there is, uh, of course, people are always asking, oh, is this all greenwashing? And if you are on the level of uh, plastic straws and something, yeah, sometimes it is. And uh, I, I think just one one comment is very interesting. So uh, at the WTM uh, in uh, London uh, this year, I was on a panel organized by Harold Goodwin on responsible tourism. And there was a your colleague, a sustainable officer from Tui, uh, uh, and certainly their customer group is is maybe less discerning than than yours, uh, more mainstream. But he also was saying that actually it has flipped that uh, he has to stop the marketing people from talking too much about sustainability, because he said. Uh, it is a process and of course they have lots and lots of properties and and other service providers and it, it takes some time to bring them around so that they he said and as Tui, a company like Tui is of course always uh critically uh looked at if they're if they do greenwashing so he said so he it used to be that sustainability sounded like oh boring or expensive and now it is the customers who are asking for it, and he has to make sure that the marketing department is not promising more than Toy can actually uh, provide at, at this given moment. And this is mainstream 
well, let's say normal <laughs> customers so also uh uh not where, where probably the majority of your customers has has more time and interest in going deeper in, in into the topic so but so i think therefore this is really a uh a promising sign and if you're saying that you're not aware that anybody ever complained that this little shampoo bottles have, have disappeared uh when they are uh, told why and why and that maybe the, the, the new product is actually uh, uh, locally sourced and so that is one step more to have an authentic experience so i think it is very encouraging to hear that and uh, obviously on, on your end that you have been proactive in many ways in doing that uh, in other parts of the industry it is maybe the the customers pushing <laughs> the, mm. the 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 industry a bit, but in the end, if we can have uh, this result, and as you said at the beginning, we have to change the way we organize tourism, uh, and we have to change it now. So, uh, Hans Magnus Enzensberger, uh, who died a few days ago, unfortunately, so he wrote in nineteen fifty seven uh, uh, this sentence: uh, "The tourist is destroying." what he's looking for by finding it. So so yeah. and this is of course a process which in many parts of the world unfortunately has happened and, and this is what we all have to fight for that that we can find ways uh, of uh, what we call meaningful tourism organization to well, avoid I, to avoid that. Can I can I counter one one element of what you just said there from that lovely quote, which is one from Voltaire. And uh, Voltaire, Voltaire said, um, don't let perfect become the enemy of good. Yes. The only thing that we, we and it is, it's a challenge because we want to be as green as possible, but we also want to celebrate the good things that people are doing. It's, and we know we're not perfect. We're not perfect, any stretch of the imagination, but we need to be better. Yes, no, that is why, why Meaningful Tourism is, is based on the concept of positive sustainability. And this is exactly also what is the idea. It is, it is, there's no point in say you have to be ashamed of uh, uh, your wish to have to have a holiday or or to have a have a good time. But we show you how you can have a a, a, a very enjoyable stay in in one of our properties without having little plastic bottles and and uh, 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 adding one more uh, plastic uh, rubbish uh, to uh, to the big heap. So that that is a point that, but you can show. Look, this is we do something positively, and your the money you're paying help is helping to plant trees, is helping to get better food for the kids in the local school. So that is exactly the approach I think we are uh, uh, seeing. Because telling people you uh, don't do this, don't do that. Uh, well, we this well, we have been trying this for many years. It doesn't it doesn't work. So well, and, we, and... we also have to do one thing further, I think, um, because uh, you know if you if you consider the, our industry and and we're in a very fortunate position at small luxury hotels of the world because our properties are small. But if I give you one example, so we've got a hotel in Sweden called Arctic Bath. Now Arctic Bath is unbelievable. Um, it's actually made up of several cabins that are floating on the river, oh, yes. several that are on stilts by the river. So it's not got very many uh, units. So that's the advantage we have. We're not building a big hotel. But the thing that I have a challenge with, for me personally, is to see a, a 400-room hotel on a greenfield site in Yucatan or wherever it happens to be, then getting a green certificate because they've just poured the thousands of tons of concrete into the ground to build it. Now, Arctic Bath, yes, you can't build a 300-room hotel where they're floating. I appreciate that. But the rooms that are floating, at the end of their lifespan, everything within it is recyclable. It's either wood or metal. It can be removed. The only thing that would be left was the, the, the concrete pillars that they use to support the, the land-based cabins. They, they literally cut that off or even they could dig them up, but they, it would basically be that hotel could be removed with no trace. And that's, we're never going to get to that with mass tourism, but we have to be thinking along those lines. We can't pour concrete into the ground and then say it's green. 
Yes, yes. No, I fully agree. I, I think I, I've seen some pictures of, of the hotel in Sweden and it really looks very, very impressive. Yeah, but of course, I mean, this is uh, clearly there are four, four uh, uh, a thousand rooms uh, place. You have to have other solutions. Yeah. But uh, that is not an excuse to say we, we don't do anything. So mm -hmm. certain. So Chris, really very uh, insightful uh, listening to you. And I think... Uh, uh congratulations for 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 moving uh the industry and showing examples uh maybe to the rest of the industry how things can be done and uh all, all the best wishes uh for you and Thank thanks you again much. for uh sharing uh, your insights with us thanks very much wolfgang thank you thank you so now I'm very happy to welcome Jani Gutka. She is working for Unseen Tours. And uh, so if you are thinking what might Unseen Tours do, well, she will tell us uh, in a minute. So uh, Jani, thank you much, very much for sparing your time with us and uh, joining us for the webinar. Thank you so much for having us and letting us share our story. Um, as part of this wonderful event you're doing for Meaningful Tourism. Thank you. And so I think uh, just uh, tell us a bit about what is Unseen Tours doing? How did you start? And uh, at the end, I think uh, you also brought us a little video so we can see how this is done in practice. That will be at the end. So please uh, go ahead and tell us about Unseen Tours. Great. Thank you. Um, so hi everyone, I'm delighted to be here. Um, my name is Janie Goodcut and I'm the CEO of Unseen Tours. We're a London-based social enterprise that provides training and opportunities for people with experience of homelessness to create their own walking tours of London. And what makes these tours very unique is that the tours are an opportunity for people to share their own stories in a way that not as often visible otherwise. Um, so the tours are a way for our guides to share what they love about the communities that they live in. They also share something about their experience of homelessness to increase general understanding about homelessness um, and to help improve attitudes towards homelessness through the conversations had on the tours. But also a nice way to see London from a new perspective. Um, um, the community stories that you wouldn't find in any guidebooks, for example, and just a more local, authentic experience that's very different to your generic tours of London, which focus just on the main tourism hotspots, so like Big Ben or the Houses of Parliament and things like that. Um, so we've been doing this since 2010 when we first started, and um, we believe we're the first organisation like this in the world. Um, since then, we've helped support other people to set up similar initiatives, working with people with experience of homelessness in a similar way, um, just to keep raising awareness about homelessness issues and providing opportunities for people with homelessness to really add value to the tourism sector. Um, and one of the reasons we feel that's really important is if we think about the, the general perception of homelessness within tourism, and how destinations generally associate or rather don't associate it with homelessness. Um, and there are some very important examples of this um, based in the UK and also in other countries in the world. Um, so if we look back at um, big global events like the Olympics when they came to London, for example, or when we had the Royal Wedding of Harry and Meghan in Windsor, um, Homeless people in these areas were very actively removed from these areas when these events were taking place because London or the UK and even any other cities in the world that have these global events don't want to be seen to be having these problems of homelessness, especially when the world is watching. Um, and so they're displaced, they're removed um, to make space for other people who are visiting for these special events taking place. Um, and this is true for for most cities around the world i'd say um but we think that this is um a shame because people with experience of homelessness have have so much 
value to add to a destination through their unique perspective and their own experiences of the city. Um, it's such a, a brilliant way to understand the hidden nuances of a city that you can't get from a general walking tour. And also it provides a less sanitized version of the city. It makes the city real, it makes it come to life. You really understand the, the values, the concerns that locals have, the experiences that locals have, um, the stories from neighbors and other community people and people who are not necessarily famous, um, but add so much character and value to a community where the tours are taking place. And that's what we're really trying to do through our tours. Of course, there's also value to the people that we work with. Um, we provide training, we help them with their mental well-being, with their self-esteem, with their self-confidence, and so many other attributes that um, are important, not just for people with experience of homelessness, but for people generally. Um, but the um, the feedback that we have from our guides is that when people experience homelessness, they're often seen to well, they're often invisible, they're often unseen. Um, if we think about how um, busy we are in our general day to day lives, um, we don't usually have time to stop and have conversations with people who may be rough sleeping um, on the streets. And so if this happens on a continuous basis, um, it really affects someone's self-confidence, their self-esteem, their sense of self-worth. And we're trying to change that by changing the power dynamic. So these are the people who were once feeling invisible, but now they are the ones who are responsible and in charge of showing you around their communities instead um, to really change that dynamic um, and... Um, promote their self-worth through the process as well and through this we've seen real development in people's confidence public speaking skills um other opportunities that they've been able to um take on as a result of becoming a tour guide and um it's something that kind of motivates us to keep going because we can see the real valuable um changes taking place on an individual case-by-case -case basis with everyone that we work with. Um, over the past 12 years that we've been operating, we've trained 24 people to set up their own tours. Um, the way that we do this is quite different to other tours um, in that we work with the guys to develop their own tours. We don't give them a set script or anything, so they have full ownership of the tours that are created. And that's really important for us as well, because it's their opportunity to share their stories with the world. Um, and the the experience that, that provides to not only travellers and visitors from abroad, international tourists, but also to locals who've lived in London their whole life. Um, they get to really understand a different perspective of a city that they thought they knew um, and find some really interesting facts that they they just didn't know otherwise. So for example, um, the first traffic light in the world was in London and most Londoners wouldn't necessarily know this fact. Or um, that there's a windmill in the middle of London as well, which people who are not part of that part of London would not necessarily know. And the windmill is quite a big structure. For, so for someone not to know that is quite surprising perhaps, but these are the stories that our guides help uncover as well as their own experiences of homelessness. Um, so that's quite unique in what we're able to provide. Um, we've been quite fortunate to have received some awards for the work that we're doing to create meaningful experiences and also opportunities for people with experience of homelessness. Um, the, the Meaningful um, Tourism Award being one of them. So thank you so much for, um, for acknowledging the work that we're trying to do to make tourism more inclusive for more communities. Um, going forward, what we're really trying to do is increase the scope of our work to other marginalised groups also. So um, it's not just people with experience of homelessness that are excluded from having this active voice in tourism. Um, there are other marginalized groups also, whether they're um, refugee communities, indigenous communities, 
um, so many other communities that face a lot of discrimination in other cities. Um, and we're really trying to use our walking tours as a vehicle, not only to provide them a platform to share their stories and to have these important conversations to improve attitudes, um, but also just provide more unique experiences that uh, are locally um, run and organised and authentic in the way that they portray a destination. And that's something that's really important to us. So um, that's that's our plans, I guess, to expand out of London, but in a way that's sustainable so we can continue to provide a sustainable route out of homelessness or marginalisation um, discrimination for the guides that we work with um, through the meaningful work opportunities that we provide, helping to increase understanding within the tourism sector that these voices add so much value um, and vibrancy and um, meaning to a place. Um, part of our work going forward also is um, to engage schools and universities um, and corporates as well who are situated in the communities that we work with so that they can better understand the communities where they live, they work, they operate um, and create some meaningful conversations and dialogue in these areas to help improve um, attitudes and stereotypes as well. Um, and this is something really important for us going forward. Um, we all know the problems of over-tourism and people sometimes not benefiting from tourism at a local level. Um, and we really hope that having these opportunities of having locals showing people around will help um, even out the imbalance. Sometimes there are there is a destination level um, and provide more opportunities for more people to engage um, in a meaningful way. There was very interesting and uh, I'm really impressed uh, and certainly the jury did uh, a very bright decision to give you the Meaningful Tourism Award. Thank you very much for uh, explaining to us what, what you're doing with Unseen Tours and uh, well I'm think, thinking probably may, many people ask the obvious question okay so for the formerly homeless people they can earn money uh, from the tourists, and that mm -hmm. is something which brings them out of homelessness. And as you said, even for the for the local community, they sh they're part of London. They show uh, the the shop owners and and uh, uh, companies there will also even benefit from from that. Uh, so, how is the work uh, of unseen tours financed? So, so because you have to spend time on on that, and uh, I can imagine that it is uh, not uh, just half a day to get a homeless person in uh, changed into a tour guide. So uh, the obvious question is, uh, so this is uh, based on charity or you get some government funding or how is this financed? Um, great question. So um, I guess there's a few ways I could answer this question. The first is how long it takes to develop a tour. Um, varies a lot because the needs of each person that we work with is so different and unique to their own experience. Um, so some tours take up to three to four months to to um, curate. Others may take 18 to 20 months, depending on what other additional support we need to provide someone. Because wow. if they are currently homeless when they become a tour guide, we want to get them out of that situation and into some stable accommodation as quickly as possible. People who with experience of homelessness may not have access to bank accounts because you need a fixed address to have all these other things um self-confidence is a big thing if someone doesn't have the confidence to share their stories um public speaking skills all of these things take time and also the amount of knowledge that our guides have of their communities it's so hard to um fit that into a two-hour tour they could give tours for weeks on end with interesting stories and interesting insights they have but to reduce that into a two-hour walking tour for our customers does take a long time as well um especially as we want to ensure it's a tour that reflects them and their interests and um, it's their perspective on London 
Um, all of our tours are bookable through our website. Um, and so the way that our organization works is based on ticket sales. Um, at least 60% of the revenue from our ticket sales goes directly to the tour guides because this really needs to be an opportunity for them to sustain a life outside of homelessness. Um, and this is the way we are doing this. Um, and the rest of the money, most of it's reinvested back into the business for other training, um, trying to get new tour guides on board for marketing, operation costs. We pay for their phone bills, things like that, just to help give them as much support as possible. Um, so because of this, we've been mostly volunteer led for the 12 years we've been in operation. So most of us have other full time jobs and we do this and we have free evenings, free weekends, whenever we get a free moment. Um, and we're really lucky to have a really dedicated team working behind the scenes, trying to grow unseen tours. But obviously, if we are a volunteer led organization, it's harder to grow our impact in a sustainable way because there's only a very limited amount of time we're able to um, commit to the organization. Um, so we have been lucky to get some grant funding um, more recently um, to try and build some more capacity. Um, and going forward, we'd like to work with corporates to see if we can have a sponsorship um, relationship with corporates to show their commitment to helping end homelessness and increase awareness about the issues that people with experience of homelessness face and um, within the communities that they're situated that could help us create more tours and increase the impact we're able to make not only in London but across other cities in the UK and the world also um so this is the way that we operate um but our guides are at the heart of everything that we do and the decisions that we make because it's an organization for them but I think as this is really such a good example of uh, uh tourism bringing benefit uh really to the bottom of the society so uh, hopefully somebody uh, may be watching the webinar or hearing for, uh, about this will say, hey, I want to do something in, in, in my city and uh, I have uh, some ideas uh, how I get maybe some uh, sponsorship for, for, for that. So uh, as far as I understand, so you would be also be happy to work with people together so that they can learn from your experience and then do this somewhere else in the world. Absolutely. Um, we're always open to having these conversations. Um, one thing that's really important for us is that the experiences are not voyeuristic. So we're they're not tours um, like poverty tourism, for example. They're not pointing out where poverty exists. They're not pointing to say, oh, this is a person sleeping who's homeless, for example. This is not what we're trying to do. We're trying to create a better understanding of homelessness through our tours. It's our guides that share their own stories and their own experiences rather than someone else pointing at poverty or pointing at um, other situations um, and discrimination. Um, so that's something that we're really keen about um, ensuring as we continue to develop into other cities, um, maintaining that our guides um, are represented responsibly and um, are really owning their stories and their tours and that communities are reflected in a positive way and that they're able to take ownership of the way in that they are represented through tourism is really important to us. So um yes, I think that is that is that is clear. And and of course this is the same discussion you have in tours in shanty towns or favelas that uh it should be done by the people and not yeah. uh, by some tour operator uh that you look at them like you like you look at at a uh, zoo or something. exactly so we absolutely is, don't uh, want yeah so yeah. thank you very much again uh for for this insights and thank you of course for the work you're doing and uh as we said at the beginning so you also gave us a little video so uh after we finish talking to each other we can also uh, have a look at how this is done in practical terms how, how it looks like so uh Jani, thank you very much again, and uh, we wish you all the best for your work. And of course, if somebody can spare some sponsorship money, I'm sure <laughs> Unseen Tours is a very good address where it can go. Maybe and we'd absolutely love to have people join us on a tour if they're visiting London also for a year. And certainly, certainly, of course, that is 
certainly an uh, experience everybody should have. Thank you, Johnny, and let's have a look at the video. I'm in Temple Park, and this used to be my home. The bench that Viv name. used to sleep on and is I, now somewhere she takes bench. tourists. Well, I slept in parks, down some stairs, behind buildings, underneath bridges, down tunnels. I'll see you later. <laughs> For five years, Viv slept rough around Temple and Covent Garden. She now works here as an official tour guide, sharing her own unique perspective. There's a vent over the underground, and people sleep up there. It's safe, and you get the heat from the trains coming up. This is a tour about homelessness and history. And Charles Dickens used to use this bath when he was a young man, and he writes about it in David Copperfield. Father of electromagnetism, father of smartphones, TVs, radios, everything else we use today. So it's my big pleasure now to welcome Callum Matthews to our webinar. He is working with 4VI and 4 written with the letter 4. So that is a rather mysterious name. But we will learn in a minute from Callum what is behind this abbreviation. So, Kellum, thank you for joining us today. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. And um, yeah, really delighted to be here. Very good. So I think, uh, well, we we are all very curious to learn about what 4VI is doing. So just uh, tell us about uh, the story and uh, the activities and maybe the future of your organization. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so... Uh, our team at 4VI is based on Vancouver Island in British Columbia, Canada. We are a social impact organization that's currently focused on the tourism space. Our origins really come from back in the 1960s. We, uh, you know, our, our formal name is the Tourism Association of Vancouver Island, and we are a legal nonprofit. And, you know, we've been around in, in various forms since the 1960s, and uh, our regional destination marketing organizations, of which we are one of in the province, um, are actually the oldest part of British Columbia's tourism system. For most of our history, we had a, and, and continue to today, have a industry-led independent board of directors who are all volunteers from, uh, and, and tourism business owners or senior managers. And our work up until about the last five years was very heavily oriented towards destination marketing. In British Columbia, we have you know, many uh, really sophisticated community tourism organizations that manage local destinations. And as these community organizations started to grow and become more sophisticated, you know, there really became less of a need for regional destination marketing. And uh, you know, I think it's fair to say that we as an organization had a bit of an a, uh, identity crisis as a result. Uh, we believed that we were in, you know, in the business of marketing, but when you looked at our, our budget and our ability to have an impact, it was quite clear that, you know, we were no longer leaders in the marketing space, uh, particularly as the industry shifted from, you know, away from print marketing tactics and towards digital that enabled, you know, any operator to connect with their, their audience easily. A big shifting point for us, uh, you know, going into the pandemic, we um, were, we, we were trying to, you know, plan through some level of change. And, you know, like every organization across the world, um, our plans were were disrupted by, by COVID. And we had to completely reimagine the role that we play in, in the tourism system here in British Columbia and on Vancouver Island. And we immediately became, uh, you know, very in tune and oriented towards supporting the, you know, particular needs of, of tourism businesses. We were terrified that, um, you know, our small and medium sized tourism businesses would uh, have unmanageable debt loads, um, that they would, you know, go out of business, uh, they'd be, um, you know, bought out by by bigger companies, and we'd have less local ownership. So we set out to first understand the needs of businesses through survey work. And then we designed a program called the Tourism Resiliency Network. And I won't get into it, but it's important that I mention it because it really played a massive role in reorienting who we are and what our priorities are. 
And in short, that program was just designed to uh, support business owners as they navigate whatever their need at the time might be, whether it's you know finance, uh, human resources challenges, um, connecting with local travelers if they rely on long haul markets traditionally. And you know the program was able to support about 500 businesses across the Vancouver Island region navigate those challenging times during the you know the highest intensity period of COVID. One of the things we observed in in the summer of 2021. Um, during two weeks in August was that Vancouver Island was 20% busier than ever before. We shattered our records in 2019, and this was without any travel from the United States or other international markets. It was entirely Canadian visitors. During COVID, we also saw, you know, the real pain caused by, um, you know, an 80% decrease in visitation. And as an organization and a board, we saw firsthand how um, it's really important that we try to strike a balance in tourism and that we try to manage the destination to uh, be you know greener, friendlier, and to have less of an impact on our residents and communities and natural spaces while ensuring our businesses can thrive. And this was really the moment for us where we knew that we needed to change our path and, and be different. In April of this year, we made the big announcement that we would be doing business under the name 4VI rather than Tourism Vancouver Island, but retaining that as our formal nonprofit legal structure. Uh, the 4 for 4VI, to me, uh, reflects the fact that we're working for or on behalf of Vancouver Island as a region. And the 4 also indicates the four pillars of social responsibility that we're committed to as an organization. Uh, that starts with with businesses, you know, ensuring that we have um, thriving businesses on Vancouver Island that uh, are in tune with the needs of our our residents and communities and 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 natural environments, uh, ensuring that our our communities are are vibrant and livable places where you know residents thrive. Um, you know, culture is, is the third one. Uh, for us, the a real important component of culture is reconciliation with Indigenous people on Vancouver Island and beyond. Uh, and finally, uh, the environment. Uh, most people come to Vancouver Island uh, because of the uh, amazing and unique environment that we have, whether it's on land or on water. And if we aren't able to protect and maintain those natural assets, uh, then we will lose one of the biggest reasons that people are coming here. Since we you know, shifted to the model as 4VI, uh, a second and really important component is that we've become a social enterprise. Um, I'm not sure in Europe, but you know, in North America, the concept of a social enterprise isn't widely embraced or, or understood. But for us, it made a lot of sense. And in short, a social enterprise is a you know, for-profit or no non-profit organization whose primary purpose is to sell goods and services to have a positive social impact. So we as an organization are able to advance our vision and mission. Uh, our vision is for tourism to be a force for good for Vancouver Island forever. And our mission is to be trusted tourism advisors and, uh, or our vision rather is to be trusted tourism advisors. And we're able to do this by taking on a range of fee for service work uh, with really value aligned clients across Vancouver Island and beyond. Um, you know, I'll mention just a little bit about some of the work that we've been prioritizing since making this shift. And it helps to sort of, uh, I think, underscore the the really big shifts that we've made at an organize, as an organization. So I think as a sort of a foundational concept for us, it's shifting our thinking away from um, focusing on demand side drivers in tourism and reorienting ourselves to be focused on the supply side. Um, and supply in really broad terms, not just what tourism experiences we have, uh, but understanding things like resident sentiment and engagement, um, focusing on reconciliation with Indigenous people, uh, using tourism as an opportunity to fight for equity and diversity in our communities and our industry, uh, committing to climate action and, and focusing on protecting sensitive ecosystems. We currently are undertaking a first of its kind in North America study that assesses the uh, the carbon emissions from all of tourism or all of tourism's activities across Vancouver Island 
Um, so we'll have that for the destination as well as our organization and a, car a decarbonization plan. Uh, we are working to advance each of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and our operations and are supporting uh, communities and businesses in doing the same. So it's really been a, a wholesale change in our approach and focus. And, um, you know, the, the work that we're doing, I should mention, you know, really wouldn't be possible without the support of Destination British Columbia, the Crown Corporation for Tourism in BC, who are a, you know, really valued funding partner and contributor to our organization, uh, as, as well as the Ministry of Tourism, Arts, Culture and Sport, who've been um, really strong partners and, you know, many, many businesses and, and communities. And I think it's probably fair to say that this is still quite early in our journey. Uh, we made the announcement in April without having you know, a formal business plan released at the time and all of the details and KPIs understood. And the reason for that was that we saw urgency and, you know, we really, and our board really wanted us to move quickly and decisively. And in doing so, we've been able to capture, um, you know, the attention and, and imagination of, of many people. But now I'm happy to say that the, you know, the planning and the key performance indicators uh, and all of the important documentation that, that demonstrates transparency and accountability in our work uh, is finally catching up. So we'll be releasing our business plan um, in December, early December, and that will um, help to, you know, I think, more formally articulate the path forward that we see and, um, and, and share how we're reimagining the tourism industry here on Vancouver Island and beyond. So, you know, hopefully that that provides a little bit of context, but I'd be, you know, very happy to answer, you know, any other follow-up questions you might have. Okay, thank you very much. So that's really impressive. Uh, and uh, I think, yeah, that was a very comprehensive uh, run uh, down of what have been, what has been happening uh, in, in Canada, British Columbia and uh, in your place. And, uh, so I, I think just one point you you mentioned. Uh, I'm I'm certain that many people will look forward to to look at your business plan and and the KPIs because uh, I think this is something where we have seen that during the pandemic everybody was agreeing. Yeah, arrival numbers are not enough uh, as an indicator for success in tourism, uh, but now we see uh, people are moving back to uh, do exactly what we do before, and and we are. Also, in the Meaningful Tourism Center, are working on a Meaningful Tourism Index, where we all are uh, collecting a lot of different uh, indicators for the six uh, stakeholders, uh, and so that we we can have also a holistic uh, picture. So it's it's very interesting uh, to 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 see that you are also uh, working in, in in this direction, and uh, so I think uh, so maybe. Quick question: Do you think you will have uh, colleagues following your your pathway? I mean, there was a lot of discussion now that DMO used to be um, meaning destination management organization, and then in the last I don't know 15, 20 years, it moved to destination marketing organization. And I heard from a lot of colleagues that they moving back to seeing themselves as a destination management organization. But of course, what you have done is, is going even a step further than that. But so do you have people knocking at your door and say, teach us? We have, yeah. And, you know, particularly what we're seeing is, um, you know, we've had interest from communities on the East Coast of Canada that uh, have a lot of interest in our new model, as well as some parts of the United States and Europe. I think for me, the, uh, you know, what the M in DMO stands for is, uh, you know, a really intriguing component of all of this. And because, yeah, you know, I think the marketing piece certainly isn't satisfactory to me um, to successfully oversee a destination we need more than marketing but management to me implies almost a level of ownership that yes. i'm not sure most um tourism organizations have so you know i really almost envision it as a you know um community based tourism organizations are um a, a really interesting path forward we you know although i think the social enterprise model may be very unique to the needs of our organization from a, you know, a financial sustainability side of things. Um, I 
have been seeing, you know, lots of really positive movement from, you know, other destinations around the world that are, you know, really joining forces with us. Uh, we have a really strong partnership with the Travel Foundation. Uh, they're involved in supporting the development of our new key performance indicators um, closer to home here on Vancouver Island. Uh, Destination Greater Victoria has been a really strong leader in the sustainability space for now many years. Um, they, you know, recently announced that they too will be working with the Responsible Tourism Institute for the Biosphere um, certification uh, like we have. And, uh, you know, so there are many, many examples now of um, other organizations that are doing really great work. And at the end of the day, our organization is focused on two things. And, you know, I think at the, it's first um, doing what we can to try to inspire change and, and lead that ourselves as best we can as a, you know, a relatively small organization. And second, um, be, you know, willing and open to share and create a pathway for others. When it comes to trying to save our, you know, our home planet, um, you know, competitiveness sort of goes out the window for me. And we are always so happy to share, um, you know, elements of the work that we're doing, if it can help others to, to make changes themselves. Um, so, you know, I think I'm starting to see uh, a really positive shift um, across the industry. And, you know, I could, I could talk for hours about all of the good work that business owners and community leaders and DMOs on Vancouver Island are doing. And um, we're just really happy to be uh, a part of that that movement and and hope to you know inspire others and 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 help folks move along that path themselves. Very good. And certainly you have been doing a lot of sharing today with us. So thank you very much again for that. And uh, uh, certainly I I will be very interested to see what's what's happening in in BC and. Uh, Hopefully that our ideas can also inspire you a little bit in that. So, Callum, okay. thank you very much and uh, have a good day. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Wow. That was a lot of uh, information, of insights, of hopefully inspiration for you and certainly uh, a way of meeting six persons who are all very active and very successful in working on a sustainable, meaningful future of tourism. So let me finish this webinar uh, by a little summary. And uh, I have a little presentation, of course, for that as well. Remember, uh, we said at the beginning, quoting uh, Niccolo Machiavelli, Never let a good crisis go to waste. And uh, I think we have seen that there is an opportunity to restart tourism in the post-pandemic era. The supply side has changed. The demand side certainly has changed to a more quality and meaningful tourism demand. There is a necessity certainly to change tourism in the ongoing climate catastrophe. There is no other way than to adapt to what is happening and will happen in the coming decades, unfortunately, for sure. And hopefully, uh, we have been able to make our point that meaningful tourism is a tool helping to achieve a sustainable fu tourism uh, future and a sustainable future, maybe in general. So... All which is left for me is to thank again uh, all our speakers in sharing their insights and experiences with us today. And of course, also all the other Meaningful Tourism Award winners uh, sharing the information which is in the book we are celebrating today. Uh, and uh, also the, the jury who are... Uh, helped us to select the Meaningful Tourism Award winners 2022 and Visit Berlin, helping us to sponsor the event in Singapore. And of course, thanking you for watching the Meaningful Tourism web webinar, celebrating the launch of the ebook, Meaningful Tourism, Best Practice Examples for a Sustainable Future. You can see the 
cover of the book on the right-hand side, and the book is available as of today for 25 euros, including VAT, as a PDF and EPUB. Uh, and you can use the link you see here with Payhip, and you can download immediately your copy of that helpful publication. I can also recommend to you our free weekly online uh, publication, which is called Meaningful Tourism Weekly. And you can see uh, with Paperly, you can also access this one. Uh, let me also mention that we have a Meaningful Tourism online training, uh, which uh, is certainly a good way to get deeper into the topic. And if you think that this concept is something you should work with. And if you want us to help you on the way, we are more than happy to do that. So please contact us under e info at uh, meaningful-tourism.com or give us a call uh, under the telephone no number you can see here. So that's it. I hope really that you uh, go home and say, wow, there's something I have to think about. If that is something we could achieve, I'm happy. And uh, for now, again, thank you for being with us and all the best for all of you.